On February 9, 1983, President Ronald Reagan held a press conference with media editors and broadcasters at the White House. And the first question came from a reporter from Bryan, Texas, named Frank May. May asked the president about an unusual off-year congressional election taking place in his district. We are, he said, the reporter, having a special congressional election involving one of your chief architects of your economic program down here in Texas. My question to you, President Reagan, do you see that election as a referendum on Reaganomics, and how do you view the outcome? How will it affect you getting your budget proposals through Congress, win or lose? Reagan's reaction was prompt and forthright. Of the chief architects of his economic, the chief architect of his economic program, he said, here is a man who had the courage to, he could have just changed parties and stayed in Congress, but he said no. He had run and won as a member of the Democrat Party, and he felt that it was only fair that he go back and give them a chance, now knowing that he has switched parties. I admire, this is President Reagan, I admire his courage very much, his principle, and I admire very much his mind, and because he was an outstanding help to us in getting our economic program started. So obviously, I've got a great interest in how he does down there this weekend, and I'm going to watch him and watch that with great interest. Yes, I am sure it would be taken as a referendum in some ways by many people if he is turned away. But of course, we all know he wasn't turned away. The voters in and around Bryan, Texas were thoroughly pleased with their Congressman Phil Graham for having helped conceive and implement the first Reagan budget and the Reagan tax cuts. And they weren't about to send him home just because he had switched parties. On election night, three days later, the voters of Texas's sixth congressional district replaced Democratic Congressman Phil Graham with Republican Congressman Phil Graham. That isn't to say that Phil Graham persuaded the people of his district to suddenly become Republican. By way of illustration, as his special election kicked off, the Associated Press ran a piece on January 11, 1983, in which one of his district voters said she was staying a Texas Democrat, no matter what Phil Graham did. But she modified her position a bit when she said that she, Wendy Graham, would still vote for her newly Republican husband anyway. In recalling the special election that sent Phil Graham back to Congress in early 1983, I think it's important to highlight two things. First, Reagan's admiration for Graham's political courage was not just rhetoric. Phil Graham was certainly under no obligation to resign and resubmit himself to election upon switching parties. The American system doesn't work that way, and nor should it, but he did it anyway because he felt that was the principled thing to do. And in fact, out of all the many party switchers in Congress throughout the 20th century, Phil Graham was the only one in the 100-year span to do what he did. That's how rare it was, and that's how extraordinary it was, and that was the source of Reagan's sincere admiration. It is a real honor to have Senator Graham here, and also alongside him, his partner in crime, Kent Hans. Another great Texan, of course, Chancellor of the Texas Tech University System, former congressman from Texas's 19th district, where before many of you were born, can I hate to say this, I was only six years old, in 1978 he beat a young opponent named George W. Bush. And another mid-1980s party switcher, of course from Democrat to Republican, in his case 1985. Yet it's what he did as a conservative Texas Democrat that attracts our notice today because Kent Hans was one of the congressmen who joined then-Democrat Phil Graham to advance the Reagan agenda in 1981. Can you imagine? What we have here on stage is a reunion, then, of two of the courageous congressmen who designed and saw through the Reagan agenda that literally saved America from itself after the disastrous 1970s. Those of us who grew up in the era of prosperity that followed owe them a great debt, and those of us who seek to defend liberty now owe them a hearing. They are men of wisdom, of experience, of sound counsel, and they are not just figures of the past. They're shaping the Texas and American future today still, and how fortunate we are to have them with us. Please help me welcome two great Americans, Kent Hans and Phil Graham. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
What? I feel like a figure of the past. <laughs> well, you're not. Oh, my God. Thank you. It, it's a hell of a deal I was standing up for. Uh. I, by the way, I asked them if they wanted me to moderate, and they said, no, we want to do it ourselves. Get off the stage, Brooke. So I'm leaving, and uh, y'all have fun. So. Well, Brooke, first of all, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, I told it before, but some of you probably weren't here several years ago. Um, when I called Lee Atwater, the president's political director, and told him that I decided to resign and run again, he told me it was a disastrous decision that I was going to lose and it was going to hurt the president. And so I told him, well, I decided it was the right thing to do. It's what I was going to do. So anyway, he goes and tells Reagan that Reagan's got to call me and that uh, this is going to be a disaster. It's going to be a defeat for the president just as we're getting started uh, in the sort of second phase of the program. And so Reagan calls me and says, could you explain this to me? And so I explained it to him, that I thought it was the right thing to do. And he said, well, I, it sounds to me like it is the right thing to do. <laughs> so anyway, I hung up. And so I didn't know until after the election was over that Atwater had gone into Reagan's office, screamed and hollered, and said, you've got to call him back. You've got to tell him not to do this. And so Reagan looked at Lee Atwater and said, Lee, the whole world is not about us. This is about him. This is what he thinks is right. Now, how different that is for someone who's president of the United States who says, the whole world's not about us. This is about him. This is personal. That's the kind of person Ronald Reagan was. Uh, we've been asked to talk about Reagan and about Trump, the Reagan first year, the Trump first year. So let me make it clear, if anybody offends Trump today, I want to apologize for Kent Hance's statement to begin with. <laughs> Kent, why don't you begin? Graham always set you up you know, when you get started. Uh, this has been going on since 81. Ernie Angelo knows that. Uh, by the way, Ernie, Penny, what a great job you've done in building the party over the last 40 and 50 years. <laughs> First guy I'd ever talked to me about changing parties, Ernie Angelo at the Hilton in, uh, in Midland. I've, I've gone by several times, I thought they'd, you, you, you get, get Salisbury to have him put a little plaque up there. <laughs> Ernie Angelo was right here. Uh, he mentioned something about Reagan. Reagan was great. Uh, he, uh, you know, I carried the tax cut. Bill carried the budget cuts. Where it's more difficult to pass the budget cuts than it is tax cuts. You go out and tell people, we're going to cut your taxes. They say, well, that's great. You're going to say, we're going to cut your programs. They get real mad. And so... <laughs> It, Graham had a tougher time, and before we leave, I want you to tell the story about the one vote and, and how, how you, you got that one vote for us. And we wouldn't have had a tax cut if it hadn't been for the one vote that, that we were able to get. But uh, President Reagan, was a, he was a loyal person. Um, after I passed the tax cut, the uh, Democrats uh, on Ways and Means Committee were going to China, and uh, the chairman, Dan Rostenkowski, uh, who later went to jail. But anyway, not, <laughs> not that I harbor any ill will, uh, but uh, he, he uh, signed off on everyone going except one person, that was me. And uh, the Washington Post had a story that said, uh, you know, Rostenkowski plays hardball and said, hey, I kicked hands off the trip and everything. And President Reagan called me. I was in Lubbock, and they uh, said, President, would you hold for the president? Sure. And uh, it's a wonder I didn't say of what. 
and that uh, he got on the, he said, I'm sorry about what happened and everything. And so he appointed me to co-chair a delegation with Chief Justice Berger to China. And Deng Xiaoping met with us and refused to meet with the Ways and Means Committee. <laughs> Reagan was good. He took care of you. He didn't forget you. And one other quick story about him that, that I mentioned some of you heard before is when we were writing the tax cut in the Jefferson room right next to the Oval Office, he came in and he said, where are you? And we were going through different segments. And uh, we were on a segment I was heading up, had to do with pharmaceutical companies doing business in Puerto Rico. When that's, he said, where are you? And I, I told him where we were. And President Reagan said, I don't know anything about pharmaceutical companies, tax breaks in Puerto Rico, and I don't want to know. He said, remember this, I want to cut taxes, I want to cut spending, I want to cut regulations, and I want to get the communist offer back. If it fits those four, do it. If it doesn't, don't do it. He said, good luck, and he left. He, Ronald, Reagan, Ronald Reagan knew who he was. He was very comfortable with who he was. And it didn't bother him. You, you know, the press would always talk about, well, that he wasn't that smart or, or whatever. He was very smart. He was very insightful. And he tried to keep things simple. In your business, you'll make things complicated. It's going to have real problems. It, you know, and he was, he, he kept it simple and to the point and, and was, was so effective when he was on TV. Uh, I mean, the, the people, the phones would just light up. And uh, <coughs> I'd mentioned before that, that when he was on TV about the tax cut, he mentioned my name three times. And, said, and he asked, call your congressman and ask them to vote for the Conable Hance bill. I got over 500 calls asking me to vote for my bill. It's my bill. <laughs> And that's when Charlie Wilson, um, he, uh, you, you've seen the movie, read the book, Charlie Wilson's War, and Charlie Wilson on, on defense matters was a real patriot. And uh, uh, Charlie Wilson, I saw him the next day, and I'm cleaning this up. I'm really cleaning it up. And Charlie said, I said, how'd the president's speech go? He said, hell, I hope he doesn't come out against sex. And, uh, <laughs> One last thing, I turn it back over to uh, Phil. You're talking about the first year, the uh, uh, tax cut, uh, Trump's tax cuts are big. People are starting to realize they have more money to spend and that it's the right thing to do. Reagan's tax cuts carried the economy for over 15 years. And when people have more money to spend, they're gonna spend more. We're gonna start collecting more revenue. And so it, it's a sound principle and, and it's good for this country. And, and Phil, you might take it from there about regulations. Well, let me, uh, let me tell three stories related to this real quickly. The first one is we had a meeting. We had had a group. We, we had come two years before Reagan. And there were seven new members from Texas, and we were all very conservative. Um, and uh, I guess we were what you would call Civil War Democrats. Uh, I was a Democrat because of those people in blue shirts that burned down my uh, mother's, grandmother's house. She said house, it turned out it was only the barn. But uh, she took it personally. But we had a meeting, we had, had about 40 so-called conservative Democrats. And so when Reagan was elected and we were beginning to decide which side we were on, we had this meeting to sort of talk about what we were going to do. And so we would, uh, some of us had decided that we were with Reagan. So they get Hans's turn to explain where he is. And so Hans says, well, I was trying to decide where I was, and I was at this town meeting. And this old farmer stood up, and I, people had asked me, and I was here, and I was there, and I was here, and I was there. So this farmer stood up, walked up front, looked me right in the face, 
and said, Hans, are you with the man or are you against the man? And Hans said at this meeting, I knew right then I was with the man. <laughs> the guy had on a John Deere, it, it, it said John Deere. It was in Littlefield, Texas. And, and I'd, I'd given an in-depth explanation of the budget. It was thoroughly exciting to no one in the crowd. <laughs> and, and he came up there and he said, are you with him or against him? And I told the president about that, and the president <laughs> used it in his speech when he was on, on TV. And, uh, and I later saw the guy, and he said, why in the hell didn't you tell him my name? <laughs> <laughs> There's a second meeting. We've come down to sort of the moment of truth that we got to decide, are we going to break with the party, Democrat Party and not only vote for this budget, but are we going to be for it? And uh, it's obvious that I was going to be for it because uh, I was, uh, David Stockman and I had written the budget. But it was pretty tight in our meeting. So we had this meeting and people went all around. They, they, they were just all over talking about everything other than making a decision. So I said, well, I can see why if they had had a debate at the Alamo instead of drawing the line, uh, there never would have been a battle there. And so Jack Hightower jumped up. I don't know if you remember. No. Jack Hightower jumped up and said, you better remember that the people that walked across that line at the Alamo all died. <laughs> And so I looked at Jack Hightower. You remember what I said? Yeah, he said, he, he, Graham looked over and he said, uh, the, the, the ones that didn't walk across the line, they died too, but <laughs> nobody remembers those some bitches' names. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> oh. Well, let me tell the story of the one vote, okay, and then I'll, I'll talk about uh, Trump. It was a very tight vote on this reconciliation bill, which allowed the tax cut and which made a lot of program changes, including eliminating three Social Security benefits. So this was a tough vote. And the night before, a guy named Delbert Latta, Republican chair, the ranking Republican on the Budget Committee, he and a group of Republicans had gotten the bill that we had put together and had made some changes. Remember that? And nobody knew about it. And uh, so anyway, they had made just a damn mess of it. And so we spent the whole day figuring out what they had done and defending it. And, but it came down to the vote. And so the vote was tied. And the last vote was a guy named Sam Hall. Marshall, Texas. From Marshall, Texas, a Democrat. And he was kind of a John Wayne kind of figure. I think that's fair, don't you? And so the speaker comes down from the speaker table. We're over there standing next to Hall. The speaker comes down and we wisely just backed away and the speaker, I pulled Graham back. <laughs> <laughs> the speaker put his arm around Sam and said, Sam, this bill is an embarrassment to the House. And I want to personally ask you as speaker to vote no. And so when the speaker had left, we walked back up to Sam and said, this bill is about America. It's not about the House. And we can fix all this stuff in conference. And so anyway, Sam stood there and he put his card in the, you got a machine <coughs> where you put your card in there 
and then you vote yes or no. So when he sticks his card in there, 434 people are looking up at his name on the board. And he reaches down and punches the green light, yes. So I've often told that story that if Sam Hall had voted no, the Berlin Wall might still be standing. Uh, it's, it's a really a case of how one person, a very brave person, really changes things. Reagan was a great communicator in the sense that, like Margaret Thatcher, he had grown up in an era where his views were totally out of fashion. And so he understood who he was, what he believed in, and like Kent said, he was very comfortable in his skin. And as a result, he was a joy to be around. He was eager to share credit with people. Uh, and he never said a word that he, he ever had to go back and try to explain. He was always on message, always on message. And as a result, he reinforced everything he did. His popularity went up, and it made it harder and harder for people to be against him. And even people that were against him had trouble disliking him. You remember the Democrat caucus meeting where the liberals were screaming at Tip O'Neill that they didn't think that Tip was fighting Reagan hard enough, and Reagan said, I mean, Tip said, you know he's Irish, and he tells a good joke, and I can't help it that I like the man. And so about two-thirds of the Democrats in the meeting stand up and boo. Trump is the polar opposite. He's easily offended. And he, you know, we all have some filter between our brain <laughs> and what we say. <laughs> but any slight, he feels that he's got to an answer. And so he makes things harder for himself. It's a great tragedy in the, in two, two, for two reasons. One, he could be a very popular president given what he's doing and what is happening in the economy. Um, I think there's every evidence that the economy is getting better. You've got to beat the American economy down to keep it from growing. And Obama was able with regulations and taxes to beat the economy into a stupor and to keep it in a stupor for eight years. So just by taking your foot off its neck, things started to get better. And then we've had this incredible deregulatory effort. Um, now, in fairness, Trump had a lot to work with. Uh, Obama imposed massive regulations on the American economy. In essence, government gained control of the commanding heights of the economy. Uh, the banking system, the energy industry, the power production industry, the internet, regulating it like it was the telephone company. But Trump has appointed good people and they have done an extraordinary job. Um, this guy from Oklahoma, who's EPA director, is the first Republican head of the EPA in American history. We never, under either of the Bushes or even under Reagan, had control of the EPA. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> So the regulatory effort has gone extraordinarily well, and as um, Kent could tell you, as Wendy could tell you, 
To be an effective regulator, you've got to know the law, you've got to know how the system works, and know what you can and cannot do. And I have to give Trump's people big time credit that they have done an extraordinarily good job. I thought the tax cut was good policy. It is a good bill. It's a long way from being perfect, but they all are. Um, but overall, I think Trump's policies have been good. He ought to have a favorable rating of 60 percent, but it's personal uh, in terms of people's reaction. And the fact that the media is, I think, different than it was when, when Ken and I were there. But I'll have to say, and then I'll turn it back over to Kent, that I know in my case, most of the things that I didn't like reading in the paper came out of my mouth. <laughs> um, uh, when I got ready to leave Congress, I don't know who it was, may have been Dave Montgomery with the Star-Telegram, said to me, won't you be glad when people aren't attacking you for things you didn't do? I said, actually, it's not the things I didn't do that's so painful when I'm attacked on them. It's the things that I did do <laughs> that are so painful. You know, one of the things that I think anyone that's dealing with President Trump, uh, and I'm talking about the opposition, if you'll poke him a little, he's going to pop you in the nose. You know, I mean, he is not going to go away. And so th there's some downside. But look, I don't think that in September before the election, I thought, you know, if we'd nominated somebody else, we could have won. After the election, I think we'd nominated anyone else we could not have won. I think Trump, I mean, he carried Pennsylvania, Michigan, Ohio, and Wisconsin. We didn't have anyone else that could do that. He was talking to people. He's got a strong base. And, uh, you know, there's, uh, there are things that, uh, we had a dog one time that was always uh, getting off target on, on hunting, and, uh, but he was good. You got to take the bad with the good. And I want to tell you something. I don't know why I thought of that story. Uh, but I'll take Donald Trump any day over anybody else on the, on the plane. And so will Phil Grant. The, uh, uh, I, I think that uh, the president, uh, you know, I mean, that's just, he is who he is. And, uh, and he's going to tell you how he feels. But you look at his appointments. I sleep better at night knowing that Mattis, Kelly, and Tillerson are there. Wall Street Journal called me. And they, they knew that I was a friend of Rex Tillerson's. And, and it, uh, they said, now, when he called Trump an idiot, and I said, well, he didn't do that. And they said, well, it's alleged. Look, Rex Tillerson, Rex Tillerson, if he thought somewhere, someone, I'm not even talking about the president, of the United States, if he saw, thought that someone, uh, any place, was an idiot, he would not say that. I just know him. He's a gentleman. He's very loyal to the president. But just those three alone made me sleep better at night. And the, the lady that's the head of Homeland Security, you know, they tried to just rip her to pieces in the Senate, and boy, I mean, she stood toe to toe with him and just kept coming back. So he's made some great appointments. Uh, I'll tell you one thing that, that on uh, EPA, that, uh, you're right, that, but there's one other. I wish he were from Texas instead of Oklahoma. I, 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 I agree. <laughs> But he wanted to be. I, I know that. I could tell by looking at him. He wanted to be from Texas. <laughs> but uh, Ann Gorsuch, she tried. Yeah. And, and, the, and we were there, and she tried to get EPA turned around, and the press just ran her out. Yeah. But her greatest contribution wasn't that she tried on EPA. Her greatest contribution, she had a son named Neil Gorsuch. Yeah.
I, I, I wish he had lived, I wish she had lived to see him on the Supreme Court. To see the vindication. That, that, that all the flag that she, and hey, he was, he was a teenager when his mother was going through all that. But, but people talk to me about Trump and everything. I say, like him. And they said, well, give me some reasons. And I'd say, Gorsuch. I don't have to say anything else. <laughs> if he didn't do anything else but put him on the Supreme Court, he's had a successful first year. But look at the other things. The Paris Climate Accord. He um, said man. no. Um, that that would have destroyed our economy. On the reconcili uh, reconciliation bill, it, and the, the people from Midland, and Odessa, and the oil patch, they know this, Anwar. We finally got Anwar open. It, I mean, that, no one thought that would happen. No one thought that would, that would happen. And so <clears throat> I, I think that, that, that uh, President Trump's done a great job. Uh, you know, I might have said things differently. Graham might have said things differently. But uh, he, uh, he is who he is. He's going to run a strong re-election. Uh, I'm for him. Everybody in here is for him, uh, that, that he's going to do what he can. But one thing I want to go back on the press. And Dave Montgomery, uh, who was Fort Worth Star Telegram, is here today and so, uh, this morning. And, and Dave, well, he tried to be fair. You know, in, in which that doesn't always happen, press. And uh, I know that shocks you. But uh, we went to see uh, what? Uh, Jim? Jim what? Jim what? He, he was he his wanted to interior have, secretary. Yeah, he was interior secretary, and he wanted to have breakfast with me and Graham, just the two of us. We said, well, sure. You know, cabinet member I invited, and so we went over there. And, and, and we had a good breakfast. We talked about issues, oil and gas issues and everything. And we got in, and I was driving, and we got to the car, and we started. And I said, you know, one thing we've got to work on, we've really got to work on, Graham, is we got to get the press kind of turned around so they'll be fair and they'll be for us. And Graham, he grabbed me by the arm, and he said, oh, son of a bitch, it's never going to be for us. <laughs> He could foresee into the future. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, you got to deal with them. And, and I, the, the thing that I get that gets me the most are some of the people that are, that are on CNN and MSNBC that they literally hate the president. And, you know, let's disagree and, and try to you know, not just be mean-spirited, but there's some that they, they do not. And I don't, you know, I didn't agree with Obama, and, and I don't think on anything. But, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I didn't hate the guy, and that uh, he got elected, and that uh, the other night the State of the Union address, you know, the, the president was talking about some things that everyone should be for but they're just so partisan they couldn't even stand on some things. I understand them not liking the budget or the tax cut and all that, that, that you know, but there were other things we ought to be united on, but not in this, not in this atmosphere. Yeah, I kind of thought the president should have stopped the speech and said, Nancy, are you all right? <laughs> hands wouldn't, hands and mean enough. Hanson mean enough to have done that. I, I remember when, when uh, Clinton was president, I, at least I had sense enough to realize how stupid you look <laughs> just sitting there. So I would try to find things that he said that I thought were reasonable, and I would applaud. So several times in, over the years in State of the Unions, I'd be the only person applauding. <laughs> but I wanted to make it clear that, you know, I didn't, it, it wasn't personal. In fact, you had a hard time not liking Bill Clinton. Uh, Obama would have been harder. <laughs> but um, part of democracy is the loser sits down. 
And it does worry me that you've got people that don't seem committed to the process that you have winners and losers, and when you lose, you let the people who win within the limits of their power put their government into place. Uh, when Clinton was president, I made it clear to him that unless he appointed somebody who was so far outside the mainstream of thinking that people who voted for him wouldn't have thought he would appoint such a person, or unless they were dishonest or incompetent, that I was going to vote for him. You won the election. I wasn't going to try to win in my vote what I couldn't, what we lost in the election. I don't understand this, and I think it's a very dangerous kind of deal. Well, Kent, why don't we both sum up and then we'll throw it open to questions. Uh, let me just sum up by saying the first year of the Reagan administration was an extraordinary year. We brought inflation down. We brought America back. Prouder, stronger, better. Um, America was in bad shape in the 1970s. And I am more optimistic today than I was in 1979 because I saw America changed. Uh, and I believe it can happen again. I think we're off to a good start in terms of our program today. I'm disappointed about health care, but we have an opportunity to go back and fix that. Uh, I think Trump's policies have been good. If he can leave trade alone, uh, I think that we can have a strong economy. And in the end, politics is not about liking or disliking. It's about is the government doing things that make your life better? Uh, and I think in the end, that's a test that if we keep doing what we're doing and the economy keeps getting better, I think we are going to have a tough election, uh, but I think we can uh, win both houses of Congress. Um, and so I think we have seen two good years, 1980 and 2017, and they've been good years because policy has been changed. And uh, if we continue to do that, uh, the economy just got better for eight years under Ronald Reagan. He did the right thing, and then he didn't screw it up. Uh, I think we've done some right things here, and I hope we won't screw it up. I, th I think that uh, one thing feels exactly right. If the government's doing, if they've got policies that are good for the people, but also when they have policy to leave the people alone, you know, not do anything to them uh, that, uh, you know, sometimes that uh, people, they, they, they want to help you because they love you and say, well, love me less. Uh, give me a chance. And that uh, looking on a couple things on President Trump, remember the last two and three years of uh, President Obama's administration? There didn't, a week didn't go by that ISIS didn't put somebody in cage and set them on fire or drown them, you know, just, I mean, just terrible things. You don't see a lot of that, do you? They're playing defense. I like for them to play defense. And, and every, every time I see Mattis, I just, I sleep better. You know, I need to get a picture of him putting my bedroom so I can <laughs> If I wake up during the night, I'll look. Yeah, okay, keep looking. Uh, the, uh, the other thing, uh, uh, immigration. Just the president's speech on immigration has slowed down illegal aliens. We, you don't have as many. The numbers are down. And he's listening to 
the border patrol. He, he's listening to them. Look, if, if you're, Trump knows this as a businessman, if you've got a guy on the first line, you, you gotta ask him what's going on. You know, and, and if he's wrong or he doesn't, then you have to get someone else. But he's listening to the people that are actually out there trying to enforce the laws that have been ignored for over four decades. And, and I think the economy is going to be fine. The stock market, everybody just said, you know, look, there's always going to be corrections. And with all the corrections, is it better today than the day he took office? Absolutely. Absolutely. And there, there'll always be some fluctuations, and that, that's, just, that's just part of the free enterprise system. You know, there's going to be some ups and downs. And so I, I, don't, I, I don't think you over, that you don't panic, you don't overreact to it. And one of the things that uh, uh, Reagan was good at, you know, uh, the first year, it, it didn't just take off after the tax cut. And, and Reagan just kind of took the approach, and I, and I asked him, I said, Look, let it work. Give it a little time. It, it's going to be fine. You know, don't overreact. And um, so I, I, I'm very optimistic about this country. I, I tell you, we got to work hard because these midterm elections are going to be tough. And that, uh, you know, we've got, we've got about 35 seats in Congress, in the House, that are swing state, as seats and that a Democrat or a Republican can win those. And so we got to work hard to make sure that we win those seats. And that one th last thing about Ronald Reagan, I had uh, Senator Brian Hughes. Senator, are you here? Yeah, there he is. I had, I invited, he was a freshman. He and Ken Paxton were state representatives. I thought they had potential. <laughs> I invited them over the house and they wanted to know about Reagan. And so his legacy lives on within the party and the things that he was able to do and that uh, the things that he was successful at doing through others that, that they came to know how he governed. And he kept it simple to the point he knew what his objectives were and he stayed on target. And on message, you couldn't shake him from message. I, I, Sam Donaldson would always try, and Dan Rather, you know, Sam was ABC, just meaner than a junkyard dog, and then <laughs> Dan Rather, and they always tried to shake him, and they, could, they couldn't budge him. I mean, he stayed on message. Graham offered, and I love this, we're probably going to run a few minutes late, which is going to make my team literally heads explode, but I think this is so great. Uh, we can take one or two questions. Mr. Cooper. One of the things that uh, we had come uh, together, in my mind, is three words. I'd like to hear what you think about peace through strength. They're on target. I mean, that, did everybody hear that? So, so he said uh, the three words that, that Reagan and Trump both use: peace through strength. Look, if you go into borrow money at a bank, if you've got a strong financial statement, you can get a good loan. If you've been repossessed ten times, you're not even going to get a loan. If you have a strong military, then you can negotiate with people, and you're going to be in a strong position, and you're not going to have any wars. If you have a weak military, that's when you're going to have wars. Yeah, I, I agree with all that, and I think Ob Obama showed that even with a strong military, you can be weak. Um, no, I'm for peace through strength. Um, I will have to say I'm worried about this budget deal being put together. You know, all these Democrats were having heart failure about the deficit on the tax cut, but this spending agreement is going to spend, send deficits up by more than the tax cut would if the tax cut didn't produce any growth. I wonder where the hell their heart palpitations will be this week. I suspect they won't have any. <laughs> One more? Yes, sir. About Reagan and how he cut taxes and cut regulation. And my question is, what do you think is the long-term legacy? What, what could be the long-term legacy of this administration? And more specifically, there's an idea out there uh, that has been endorsed by Ed Meese George Schultz and unanimously by the RNC with the approval of the White House for a constitutional amendment to require that regulations be approved by Congress called 
Let me do this first. Well, and I, let me say, to wrap up, um, let's vote yes, but let's also focus on like, yeah, the just question. Talk What's the long-term legacy? What is going to be the legacy yeah. of this administration? It's going to depend on what they do from this point forward. Um, they have done enough to get off to a very good start. And if they can stay on this path, um, you're going to have people who are going to say, well, you know, I didn't love old Trump, but I loved what his policies did. But the jury's still out there. Playing well in the first quarter does not guarantee you're going to win the football game. <laughs> Kent, you want to? I think you summed it up. Yeah. Please help me thank two of the greatest Americans alive today. All right, y'all enjoy the morning, and we'll see you back at lunch with Lieutenant Governor Patrick. Thank you all.